nice background. Very. Thank you very much. You can see, this is our uh, the cover of the uh, Aristocrats live album that's coming out on uh, May seven. Yes, sir. And uh, you know, there we are. We're uh, oh, and then there's this guy. Wait a minute, I got to get out of I got to get out of his way. But <laughs> who did the art for that? Like, what um, is, is that? He's, he's holding up a little sign that says "freeze." Yeah, Basically, he's, the, he's the the enforcer of lockdown policy. Uh, uh, the guy's name is Tom Colby, and he's actually Italian. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a it's a scene in a in a kind of a northern Italian piazza where uh, we're we're walking on our way to the gig. And then there's a big sign. This is the marquee of like, we're you know, where we're playing. But of course, nobody can play because of our, of our very strange time. So the album is called Live in Europe 2000. And it was recorded back in February 2020 when we were still on the road. It was kind of right before everything happened. And so uh, it's just a, you know, funny little scene there. And, you know, they've got the Lego versions of us and all that. Yeah, I love it, man. I think it's cool. <laughs> um, well, before we get into that, I wanted to to cut back to, uh, I just, you know, saw your post that it's been 10 years of the aristocrats, which seems crazy to me. Yeah. Like, how, how does that make the, you feel? Were you at the first show? I don't think I was. Were you at the first show? No, but I remember hearing about uh, it and just being like, this is going to be nuts because, you know, knowing you three guys. It's, you know, you just never know, you know, you do a lot of shows uh, at NAMM and other places where you just get together with a, a group of guys and you just don't ever really know what the reaction is going to be. And so uh, we could feel it in the rehearsal the night before that maybe there was something special going on, but you never know. So uh, we did the show and then the reaction seemed you know, it was designed to be a one-off. We weren't the aristocrats at that time. It was just, you know, Guthrie and me and Marco doing a gig at the Anaheim Bass Bash. And uh, and now 10 years later, here we are. So uh, we're really grateful. I'm really grateful for it all. And it just goes to show you, you just never know, you know, when you get together with a group of guys and do a gig, what's going to happen? You just, you just never know. This is, we've done four studio albums now, and this will be our... Uh, third live album really there's a there's a fourth one but it was a real limited edition thing uh and uh you know we have been around the world a couple of times and it was i mean i i you always hope that uh you know when you form a band it's going to go well even in my wildest dreams i never imagined that we would be doing 120 show world tours you know uh, on on every major continent so it's been an awesome ride and uh hopefully this album you know gives people some of the vibe of you know what we do on stage and the way that we feel when we're communicating with each other in the live moment now that we've been together for a few years yeah well do you do you feel like there's a solid takeaway of of what's changed from when you guys first jammed and and up to now i mean obviously you've kind of learned to gel more but like can you see the differences in yourself or how the band grew well, we know each other so much better, you know, I mean, like, we, you know, there's still a lot of improvisational stuff that's going on, but every musician has their own personal vocabulary. And, you know, when you do four or 500 shows with somebody, you know, you, you, you get really familiar with what that is. And uh, that gives us a really, really strong foundation from which we can take material that we already know and we can kind of push it in a lot of different directions. And, uh, and, and the success rate of that highly improvisational moment, I think, goes up when you have that familiarity. It doesn't mean that you stop taking chances, but it does mean that I think the chances that you take have a higher degree of success, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and also there's the sonic aspect. You know, we know each other's sounds too. I'm a big sound guy. You know, I know what Guthrie's guitar sounds like when he goes for certain things. And I know what Marco's drums sound like when he goes to play maybe a complex fill or do a certain kind of groove and, and those sonic imprints and trademarks uh are another aspect of what makes the kind of you know the group communication better over time because we develop those things that'll work better with each other not just kind of like you know on our own thing and again that's the only the only way to really refine that stuff is to go out and play a ton of live shows you know mm -hmm. you play the same thing kind of but not really in 50 different venues over the course of eight weeks you know you learn a lot and uh, all of that knowledge, I think, eventually gets put to good use. 
Yeah. And, I mean, leading up to these shows that you recorded, you were, what, like 100 shows deep on uh, You Know What, right? Yeah, we were getting close to the 100 show mark when, uh, when, uh, when the shutdown started. Yeah. So did these songs evolve much for you or or. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You could listen to the studio recording and listen to the live versions and be like, whoa, they really they really open that part up or oh, look at that little thing they put there. Or, you know, the just, you know, then there were things that were happening, of course, that were different every night. There were also things that became institutionalized, you know, as you, you know, go through a show number 10, 20, 40, 60 something really cool happens and you go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I want to remember that because that was, that was something really worked. And then also when you engage the crowd's reaction, you see if it's something that really landed for them you know, and you can deliver it at a certain moment every night, then maybe you go back to it. And, I mean, at some level, you want to make sure that you don't do too much of that because then it's not improvisational anymore. But I don't think there's any cardinal sin being committed in having little signposts like that that accumulate over time either. Yeah. So it was more gradual. It wasn't like you thought of you know, somebody thinks of an idea and like and then brings it to a rehearsal or something like that. We, we don't rehearse. <laughs> We're the laziest band ever. <laughs> we just we, we, we I mean, first of all, Guthrie lives in the in London and we live in the States, so we don't have the jam room that we can just go to and work stuff out. Uh, but the truth is, is we work it all out during the show. I mean, it's really rare that we have to kind of get together and be like this this little part right here like let's let's work on that you know it's just it's not that kind of party for <laughs> lack of a better phrase yeah right on well oh. take take us into um i mean february 2020 you guys were were playing about i'm guessing since you you know have these recorded you had already planned on making a live album or were you just like recording a bunch of shows to see what happened we were recording everything just because we could. Okay. It was uh, our engineer, Dimitris uh, Karpuzis, great guy from Greece, uh, had the capability to record the multi tracks while he was doing a live show. And we were like, well, why not? You know, you know not every show is completely awesome, uh, but you learn a lot from listening to recordings. And not like we were listening to recordings along the way. We were not doing that uh, because, uh, you know, that, that can really change your perception of the way the live show goes. And we try and stay away from that. But we did take a moment to, because the European tour was in two legs. We did six weeks in late 2019 and then another six weeks in early 2020. We were talking about maybe doing a live album, if I recall correctly. And then over the break, we listened to a couple things. And we just we thought that we wanted to add a couple of ambient mics and crowd mics to make it not quite so dry. Uh, and we liked what we were hearing, but we felt like things were progressing. And we were like, yeah, you know what? There may be some stuff in the second half of the tour that's better in the first half of the tour. And let's just keep recording and see what happens. So that's what we did. And uh, we got to the end of the tour. You know, we, we the tour ended on March 5. Just think about that. We all know these dates really well now, right? March 5, 2020 was the end of a, you know, 60 show European tour. I mean, we got really lucky, you know? Uh, if, if it was a March-April tour, then April would have gotten wiped out, and some of March too. But instead, it was November, December, January, February, March, essentially. So we felt fortunate about that. But then, of course, you know, uh, we went home, and I watched as all the other bands that were still on tour, you know, were kind of like they were like stars falling out of the sky, you know, like one after another. Oh, we're postponing, we're canceling, we're coming home, and da 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 da. It was just bizarre to watch it all. And then, of course, those first couple months of of COVID last year were just complete twilight zone for everybody. You know, nobody knew what we were going to do. Uh, and the, the thing about us is that we are not a, a, a Dropbox band. You know, we, we all our records we've recorded in person, we get together in a studio and we do them. So we never had the idea that we're like, okay, now we're going to make a, you know, we're going to start making, you know, the, the, the videos with the four squares that look like the Brady Bunch and stuff like that. Like, I'm not, there's anything wrong with that, but we just decided that we weren't going to do that. Uh, Guthrie in particular is not really a fan of video. He's just a purist about the live element. So we knew we weren't going to do that. And we knew that we weren't going to record a studio album. And so it's like, well, let's take a look at this live stuff and see what we got. And so I started diving into a few shows in the second half that I thought were, you know, maybe the peak of where we were uh, before, you know, everything got shut down. And, 
And it didn't take long to find uh, some really good stuff. And it all happened in Spain, strangely enough. Uh, it was uh, three shows in Spain that I started zeroing in on. And, uh, and then we kicked it back and forth to the band and, you know, made sure that we all liked it and mixed it and bang. How long was that process just like weeding through? I mean, did you remember you're like, oh, when we were in Spain, these three nights were amazing or was it? Okay. Yeah, there were a few shows I remember that I thought, you know what? I remember the, the communication being really good on these nights. Uh, and uh, and so I just took a shot at it. There was no guarantee that that was, that was going to be right. And if, if a couple of the shows that I thought were good, I listened to it. I was like, eh, not sure that's not sure that's release quality. But a couple of them, because I, I, I targeted six and uh, and three of them were like were, were pretty spot on. And then. There's the thing of like, okay, well, every room sounds different, and you know, the three of them, of the three of them, there was one that definitely sounded better than the other two. So I really kind of zoomed in on that one, but we, but we took a, a couple tracks from the other two just because the performances I felt like were were really special and unique. There was stuff that happened there that was good, that didn't really happen anywhere else. And I felt like we were communicating really well as a band, and uh, and and you know, Marco and Guthrie, we all listened to them together, and we thought, yeah, this is, this is a good and proper representation of what we were doing at the time. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, do you, can you like recall anything from those shows besides just feeling good? Or was it like you had an awesome meal beforehand or something like that, that just set you all off? It's always the sound. I mean, it's the sound, but it's not just the sound, but it's mostly the sound. It's the sound. And then like the shape of the room and the vibe of the crowd, like, is it one of those things where, like, uh, you know, the crowd is really far away and they're sitting down and it feels, you know, that's always a bit of a challenge to kind of get the, the rowdy energy. Uh, uh, is it one of those things where we can feel them, get their responses and, you know, is it, was it comfortable on stage? No, it wasn't too hot. Like, we're, like, sweating, like, you know, like someone dunked us in a tank of water. Those shows are, you know, they're never great. You get through them. Uh, and uh, and then the sound on stage, the monitoring, you know, every 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 show is different. And then there's the thing of the three of us, where a lot of times you'll have two people who are like, oh, that was really good. And then the one other guy's like, oh, man, I, I didn't really hear that well. And I wasn't as communicating it as well as I could have. And so it's, it's hard to find a show where all three of us were like, yeah, that was that was really good because we're all our, our own worst critics, just like everybody. Right. So uh, it turned out that I remembered that there was a show in Sevilla that I thought like, we were really, really on. Uh, and I also remembered that, uh, actually our manager, Ricardo Capelli, remembered that there was a, a, a show in Bilbao where Marco had done an exceptional drum solo and, and the vibe of a, 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 one of our older songs called Get It Like That was really, really good. Uh, and so he remembered that one. And then there was a couple of uh, other ones where I was looking for a song called Spanish Eddie. Uh, which is a really, really tricky song to pull off all the way through and have it be good because there's a lot of starts and stops and there's a lot of uh, wide open improv sections where anything goes and it's eight minutes long and, you know, it's just it's just a hard one to just get eight minutes of like, yep, there's nothing in there that's like, ooh, I don't know about that, you know? So, uh, and of course, we're not approaching shows like that thinking of what's, you know, we got to make sure that we get this right for the live album. We weren't thinking about that at all. We were just getting up there and going for it and, and seeing what happened and then, you know, kind of sort out the bodies later. Yeah. You know, that's what I was trying to think about. Your band is like, is the magic that you guys are all have like kind of a similar vocabulary or is it that you're all, um, you're all dedicated to pushing yourselves? It's kind of a combination of all of that. I mean, you know, we, we, we have a, 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 an interesting constellation of kind of fire and earth, if you will. You know, I mean, I'm a more, and of course I'm the bass player, right? So there's a reason why I chose playing bass is because I'm, I'm pretty grounded and I'm interested in foundations and grooves and some kind of stability. Uh, whereas Marco is kind of a wild improvisational drummer and anything can happen at any time. Uh, and Guthrie is a great improviser as well. So I always kind of look at the whole constellation as like, I'm kind of, standing on the ground like this and like holding these two wild kites you know it's like they you can't just let them go because then the kite's gone uh and but you know no no one's interested in just watching somebody stand on the ground either so there's a good interesting mix of like uh pushing and holding 
that goes on at all times. And, you know, every once in a while, the dynamic will change, where Mark will have a show where he feels like he wants to play a little bit more conservatively, and I'm pushing hard. Uh, and, and same with Guthrie, you know, there, it's, it's a, it, with music like this, and especially in a trio where there's so much room to push and pull, you know, the, the, the person in the band who's a little bit more aggressive can change every night. You know, some nights I'm really just kind of sticking more to the script, and then some nights I'm trying to push everything. And uh, I think everybody has nights like that. And ideally, it's when everybody is kind of feeling each other's, you know, amount of push and pull, and it turns into a thing where you're just kind of tossing the ball around and not really thinking about it and having fun with it. That's that's when the magic really happens. Yeah, that's I'm amazing. I'm not sure that that answered your question, but I think it does. It does. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of it's a little bit of a nebulous question, you know, like I'm trying to turn the mirror on yourself, I guess. So yeah. Well, you know, again, it's it's one of those things, if you look at it too closely, you know, you start to miss the kind of big picture of it. I don't know why, you know, me and Marco and Guthrie ended up being, you know, such a, uh, a, a unit that's translated uh, as interesting and cool for so many people. Uh, I'm just grateful that it happened. You know, uh, I, I know that Marco and I, there's music, the influences that Marco and I are into that Guthrie's uh, not into. There's stuff that Guthrie and Marco are into that I'm not into. And there's stuff that Guthrie and I are into that Marco's not into. So, you know, and there are some commonalities, of course, but not everything. Yeah, you guys are so, like a Venn diagram. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Um, do you have like a favorite moment from the album? from the new live album yeah you know start to get into like which one of your kids is your favorite you know yeah. uh, I, I, I think that uh, I, I think that there's a lot of stuff in uh, in Spanish Eddie uh, where we were improvising that was really cool we, we kind of went through this one little section where it's very kind of Zappa like where we just started taking the piss out of a lot of different genres uh, and it was going very fast uh, there's this there's this one part where Marco is paying, playing like a double time break beat and Guthrie is playing the melody from the flight of the bumblebee and I'm playing the bass line from the chicken. <laughs> and it's just, I, I remember listening back to that bit and just being like, how the hell did that happen? Because <laughs> it was just a really absurd climax of this very absurd solo section that wasn't meant to be taken seriously anyway. And uh, immediately after that moment, it all kind of exploded and dissolved. Which was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that was an interesting moment, I guess, if I had to choose one. Yeah, that's another thing I appreciate about about the band is just that, like, you, the music can be serious, but it's really, like, there's a lot of comedy in it, too. Well, that's the Zappa tradition. I mean, that's yeah. one thing. One artist that we were all influenced by and all into is Frank Zappa and the idea that you could play interesting and complicated music and not have it be serious and you could take the piss out of it at any time. And of course, if you, you know, come into one of our shows, we didn't even the dialogue all kind of telling these funny stories about the origin story of the song because, you know, that gets a little old. It's like uh, on a record, it doesn't translate the same way I think as it does in the live hall. You know, uh, we're, we're, we're up there in the live show and we're trying to, kind of break the fourth wall of this, you know, audience watching the concert, con uh, watching the musicians, musicians playing for the audience. And we're just kind of trying to crack jokes and make everybody relax and have fun. So we all feel like we're just kind of hanging out together. I think that's when the best shows happen. Uh, but uh, on the on the live recording, it's just it's just the actual music. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I mean, from the very beginning, I mean, just the name the aristocrats is obviously it's based on the dirty joke. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to have fun with it. We're not trying to, you know, pull off some kind of like classical recital or something like that. And uh, I think that there, there's, a, especially in, in, in fusion and instrumental music, it can get a little serious and we're determined not to have that happen, I guess. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I really appreciate the uh, rendition of Mozart's D grade fuck jam, or movie jam. That's very yeah, nice. Exactly. The Bach. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's the thing. It's like when we're trying to figure out the, the names for songs and stories for songs, that one was what's funny in particular just because, you know, there was a reviewer from one of our uh, uh, early, early tours. We were coming to North Carolina, and this guy was writing for, like, the, the hipster alternative weekly paper back when such a thing existed uh, uh, and was basically previewing our show. Uh, and 
said something like, oh, these guys are great at their instruments and, you know, they're better at, at what they do than I'll ever be at anything. But, you know, if you think I, if you think I want to sit there and listen to, you know, an hour of their degrade fuck movie jams, you know, I've got better <laughs> things to do. And I was like, wow, that's first of all, that's a great, great line, you know, degrade fuck movie jam. And this was all the way back in like 2012 or 13 or something like that. I just filed it away as a potential concept for a song title and, and 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 in 2019 when i was trying to write songs for the you know what album i thought you know what it's time to dig this one up what would a d-grade fuck movie jam by the aristocrats actually sound like so of course there's way too much wah-wah guitar and there's the you know the whole song is built on the bounce chicka wow wow melody i mean it's just like so unbelievably dumb <laughs> but that's the point yeah Delightfully dumb, I would say. I love it. <laughs> oh, man. Well, we do have to geek out about bass stuff a little bit. Absolutely. As, as long as you're cool with that. Um, oh, yeah. What's what's new and exciting for you right now, bass-wise? Are you, are you, like, pumped up about something? Are you always tweaking? Or are you kind of still set with what you got? Well, you know what's interesting is... Uh, you know, a few years ago, I had most of my instruments stolen, which uh, really kind of caused me to have to go back to the ground level and rebuild my arsenal. And, and that I actually learned a lot in that process. Not that I would recommend that as the origin point for such a process for anyone else. But I, uh, I learned a lot about why I like the instruments that I liked. Uh, and so I had a couple of different sounds going. I have this Mike Lowell Modern 5 uh, uh, this basically it's a bright active jazz bass. It's built to be kind of bright and aggressive. Ash body, maple top, maple fingerboard, uh, Seymour Duncan 67, 70 pickups in there. It's just designed to be kind of a bright, brash, you know, rock active jazz five string. Not quite as sweet as a maybe a Sadowski or a, or a Ken Smith or something like that. Uh, a little rowdier than that, but still an active jazz and a five and a 35 inch scale. And, and that has been my main instrument. But then of course, sometimes you want a darker sound. And so I had a, I have a five string Michael PJ, which is passive, which is an alder body with a rosewood fingerboard. I roll off the tone knob, so it's kind of dark. And that gives me more, more of a kind of a vintage thing while still being a five string. And the Michael basses just have a really nice architecture for my physiology and geometry when I play, I just really like the way that they feel. And they're bolt-ons and, and that's a thing. But, you know, I was starting to think that I wanted some kind of third alternative, which was a modern sound, you know, more of a kind of a mid-rangey focused sound. And so uh, I had uh, been inspired by a bass player named Dan Briggs, who was the bass player for uh, Between the Buried and Me, a great progressive metal band. And the, the, that material was really dense really crunchy guitars and meanwhile this bass tone it was so clean and clear just kind of sitting in the mix and the mids were so present it was just like man it sounds great and i was like what is it and he said he told me it's a specter so i started talking to specter and Spectre. i long story short it's not not so uh, short actually uh specter sent me an alex webster signature model uh uh five string and i just loved it i was like this thing is great because it was it was doing a great job of kind of cutting through loud stages and it had this kind of bell chime on the top of this focused mid range and these really, really great lows. Uh, but they were neck through instruments and those just feel different. You know, they sound different and they feel different than bolt ons. And, and I kept trying to get my, I had three different specters. I, I had an, I had another one made, which is a, a, a all ash, a forte, which has the wide neck because the typical Spectre has smaller string spacing than I'm used to anyway. And that was a little awkward. So I was like, well, make me a wide. Well, the wide just feels so big for some reason and uh, sounds amazing. But I, I, live, I just kind of felt a little bit limited by it. Kept trying to work through that over the last couple of years, but I never quite got there. So where I've, I've ended up settling is that I had Mike Lowell uh, and, you know, rest in peace, Mike Lowell, you know, the luthier who just passed away last year. Uh, we worked on a version of a Mike Lowell that would do that kind of mid-rangey focus modern compressy thing. And, and that's called, that's a new signature model called the BBMF5. It's a Brian Beller Modern Focus 5. And it has a lot of the same qualities as that Alex uh, Webster signature, and just in a bolt-on. Uh, it's got a, uh, you know, it's an alder maple top, a, uh, an ebony fingerboard. 
And then it's got EMGs in it, which I never had in any of my instruments. They all were kind of classic Fendery type stuff. So the, I have the EMG 40 DC pickups in there and the EMG BQC uh, three band preamp. And man, it sounds really great. It does not sound like a Spectre neck through. Uh, there's, a, there's a very, very special thing that only a neck through will do. Uh, but I felt much more comfortable playing that Mike Lowell uh, live when I wanted to go for that sound. So when I went out for the You Know What tour, I essentially had three instruments and they were all Mike Lowell's. Uh, the, uh, the bright Modern 5, the vintage passive PJ5, and this BBMF5 for modern kind of focused sound. Uh, and now in the studio, uh, I use the Spectres in the studio when I'm going for that kind of like really modern compressy sound because they're just amazing sounding. Uh, and I don't have to, you know, it's different when you're in a controlled environment than when you're playing live in terms of physical comfort when you're playing. Uh, and so I use them all now. I use all the Lulls and all the Spectres and that's my world. But I also have a Fender P that I use for some things, a plain old made in Mexico, you know, Fender P. And I actually, and that's got a rosewood fingerboard. But I also just got a, a Fender P with a uh, with a maple fingerboard uh, because I find that that instrument uh, fits really well with some of the Joe Satriani stuff that I that I'm because uh, I've been touring with him since 2013 and Joe Satriani's demo bass is an old Fender P with a maple jazz bass neck and that's a really specific thing uh, and I find that it fits really well with his guitar sound. A lot of times it's about how well does the guitar and the bass fit together. So I have that as well now, and I'm recording an album for Joe uh, remotely, uh, which is interesting because he's never done that before. And so we're, you know, we're in the middle of that. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, so that's, that's, that's pretty much the story, is those Mike Lulls and a uh, couple of Spectres and, uh, and those P basses. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and my recording setup is really, it's really basic. I mean, you know, I just I don't, I don't have like tons of outboard rack gear or anything like that. It's just a, an Apollo twin with the Universal Audio, you know, uh, Neve 1073 plug-in uh, console for mic freeze and 1176 for compressor. And uh, I do a clean and dirty channel. With the dirty channel, I use a dark glass Alpha Omega for, for most of my dirty stuff, but sometimes I'll use other stuff. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not rocket science. I think a lot of it comes from the hand anyway. Yeah, that, you know that I just sound and articulation. That's a big thing that that you know you kind of help push. Do you think that's what most people are missing, anyways? That it's still just from your hands, like doesn't matter what kind of stuff you're running. That's, it's certainly the, the the only thing that affects everything, because it's at the beginning. That's the very beginning of the chain of sound that you're pushing through. You know, before the strings, before the pickups, before the electronics, before the preamp, before anything, your hand is the only thing that pushes all the way through. So yeah, you want to make sure that you have the right gain structure and your hand is is actively engaged in producing the tone that you want to produce. Uh, and, and starting there is a, is always the best place to start, I feel. But uh, but yeah, I mean the sound of something is like the most important thing. How do you even know who like when you're listening to somebody who they are? It's because your ear goes, oh, I know what that sounds like. That's Victor Wooten. Oh, that's Jocko. You know, oh, that's John Paul Jones. You know, it's like that d developing. That's Flea. Uh, developing something like that is, 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 is more important to me anyway than developing technique because it's not like people recognize people's playing because it's in, like, you know, an F sharp Lydian scale played at 200 beats per minute or something like that. It's because they recognize the sound of it. It's the same reason why people like their favorite bands because they can put it on for five seconds and they go, oh, I like the sound of that. Mm hmm. Yeah, and that seems like it's probably just a time thing as well, right? To find your sound. Well, yeah, you, you know, you, you have to kind of go through a bit of trial and error, and figuring out what works and what doesn't, and playing with a couple of different groups of musicians so that you recognize what it is that is there every time. What's the thing that you want to bring every time? I think most people have an idea of what the sound is they want to produce in their head already. But the trick is trying to translate that into physiology you know, into what, into how you play with your hand, into what kind of instrument you play, what kind of pickups there are, what kind of active EQ or onboard controls, if any, that you need for that. And, and then when you're on stage, what kind of amplification and monitoring, which is so important, monitoring, what kind of monitoring you need in order to produce the sound that you want to hear. 
So bridging the gap between the sound that you already hear in your head and the sound that you're producing is kind of the lifelong quest, right? Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's a lot of the the uh, kind of base question stuff I had, but I did want to ask you, what's been the best thing uh, to happen to you in the last year? Oh, well, the best thing uh, to happen is just the opportunity to slow down. You know, I've been just going so fast. I'm a, mostly a touring guy, you know. I mean, uh, I do recordings here and there when I'm home in between tours, especially for albums for the aristocrats. And of course I did, I spent a couple of years working on my solo album, Scenes from the Flood, which was a double album, 18 songs, and this big progressive concept album. Uh, and uh, and that's, that's a different thing, but uh, most of the time out there touring. And uh, that's, I'm fortunate enough to have made my living, you know, recently with Joe Satriani and the aristocrats, just touring over and over and over again. And, uh, you know, that's great and i'm grateful for it but also it is exhausting and uh and believe it or not i am the kind of person who actually is a nester and i like stability so i've chosen a bit of a strange profession i realize but uh this last year has been an opportunity to really just kind of slow down take stock uh you know get a little bit healthier uh and uh and, and just realize that there's there's more to life than constant travel. I wouldn't want it to be like this forever. And I certainly, you know, the, what's happened is a, is a ridiculous, terrible tragedy. And, uh, and it's just awful. Uh, but you got to find the good where you can find it. And I think that that, hopefully that's not, that, that's true for a lot of people. I mean, I decided right at the beginning that I think there was a, for creatives, I think there was a bit of a pressure to kind of put out video content like, right away like you know we've got to do something we can't just sit here you know and, and i really really strongly felt otherwise i felt like it was a time for for creatives to you know take a moment to absorb the atmosphere around us because in order to be able to produce something creative i think you know we need input you know we at least i do you, know, you gotta you gotta you gotta refill the tank before you can start dispersing creative energy again so and I had, you know, I, my tank was pretty low from, you know, doing scenes from the flood and then also the aristocrats, you know what, really pretty much at the same time and then going out and touring for a year. Uh, I was ready to do more. I was ready to jump on the road with Joe Satriani and that was going to be a whole another year. But we'll we're getting to that. And that'll be the first thing out of the gate when we when we resume. But uh, I think that the uh, the idea that we can stop and take a breath is not something that should be kind of like, you know, uh, shamed in any way. Uh, we need that. Now, we also got to eat. And that's a whole other thing. You can't just sit there. You know, somehow you have to figure out a way to make it work. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people out there that, you know, that, that are struggling right now. And, and uh, it's really, really terrible what happened. And I feel very fortunate, you know, just to, you know, just to just still be here. But, uh, it's okay to stop. It's okay to slow down. That's what I found over the last year. We'll see if I can uh, crank it back up and get back out there, you know, if <laughs> I have to shake the rust off a little bit. But I'm very, very grateful to have had this opportunity to go a little slower. Yeah, for sure. So with that said, uh, what else do we can we expect from you this year? You said we're you're recording on uh, Satch's new album, which is pretty amazing. Anything you can tell us about that? Well, uh, I, I can tell you who's on it because Joe has already said it publicly. It's mm -hmm. me and Kenny Aronoff on drums and a keyboardist named Ray Thistlethwaite, who uh, is uh, an amazing he's a guitarist also and singer. Uh, he's a, a famous Australian guy. And he, he's also the keyboardist in a, in a band called Knower, which is, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with that whole world of Lewis Cole and, and that, those, those crazy kids. Uh, and he's an amazing player, and so uh, I'm looking forward to collaborating with these guys. And uh, and there's some other aristocrat stuff in the background. I can't talk about it yet, but you know we will at the proper time. And and I've been doing recordings for people throughout the last year. You know while I've been home, so some of that stuff is going to come out. And I've, I've heard a lot of it is interesting. There's another great opportunity I should have mentioned while I was home is, is that I got to record more. You know I got to touch base with a lot of people who 
Otherwise, if they had said, oh, can you record a couple of songs for my album? I'd been like, well, I could do it maybe in two or three months when I get home, you know, and this and that and everything. And that doesn't work for everybody's schedule. But now, you know, we can do it. So that's a good thing as well. Awesome. Well, definitely looking forward to that, to hearing more from you. Yeah, well, thanks very much. And, you know, always really, really grateful to everybody at No Travel for being so supportive of, of what I'm up to and what the bass community is doing. And, you know, we'll get back out there. It's I feel like we're almost there. It's almost over. Yeah, I think we're around the corner. We're just around the corner, man. We're almost there. <laughs>